hour session. Actually, uh, we'd like to be done by just before 10 o'clock because we have Dave Luer coming to speak to us between 10 and 12 this morning. So we're going to try and stick to that timeline. I hope uh, those of you that are online, if you don't mind turning your video on so that the presenters can see who's there. Um, I know a lot of times when we're doing Zoom meetings, we just don't have the video going. But th in this particular case, uh, get out of your pajamas and put a smile on your face and join us. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Um, the other thing is, is that at the bottom of your screen, there's a little kind of a, if you want to ask a question, you can kind of raise your hand. All you need to do is uh, click that button. Uh, there's a chat box as well. Evan is going to be watching the chat box, and as questions come up, uh, we will present them to uh, either SGI or ourselves. I, I did send out an email earlier today, and or yesterday I should say, in regards to kind of a little of agenda. Uh, what we want to do, folks, is we don't want to focus on the little nitpicky things where the guy did that one-time thing that annoy you. We're trying to look at the big picture items that maybe we can work together on and make a change for the better as a group. Like, um, you know, we can bang heads all we want, but the reality is, is we got to figure out a way to work together, right? So if we can kind of focus on the big picture items and uh, all the little minute, like uh, we'll deal with that maybe at another time. But uh, to, for today's meeting, what we want to do is really kind of look at the areas that we can make some change that's going to move things ahead for everybody. So uh, I think uh, Karen is on the line now. And I would like to let him uh, make his opening comments. And if he wants to refer to the little agenda I sent him, that would be great. Perfect. Okay. I've got Kieran with me in the room now. So apologize for that. We'll, we'll start over here. Um, so yeah, I, we weren't understanding, Tom, that we would necessarily be leading the agenda. This was more an opportunity for us to hear, we thought, from a select group of the SAR executive uh, exclusively and not third parties. So I'm struggling a bit to understand how we, we envisioned this going. So maybe if I could pass it over to you and get some kind of a round table here in terms of who is actually in the meeting. Sure, what we've done uh, is we've made it available to our executive. The way we set up the meeting is so we've done it through Aspen Film. So there is a, a web link where people can go in and listen in. Uh, we've muted all the microphones. If people wanna watch and, and see what's going on, if they wanna ask a question, they're certainly welcome to ask a question. Uh, but the, the meeting was primarily directed towards the executive, but we do have other people that are interested in hearing what you guys have to say. So we want to keep it respectful. We want to keep it professional. Uh, we want to cover the high level issues that we all think we can work together to change. Um, so we just put it out to the membership in general. Hope that works for you guys. Yeah. So but again, we're going to Tom, Tom, Tom I, I talked to you about this, the concerns that I had regarding us going even outside your area directors. I was clear about that when we talked. I don't understand this. This 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 departs significantly kind of from where we were we where we were going. So you know, I guess again, we're going to have to ask you to to lead the agenda here. We you had provided an email um, CC to the executive that identified several concerns, and um, we gave a fairly a very comprehensive response to that. And so our understanding was that this was an opportunity for you to perhaps uh, provide or ask more questions further to our response. Because I think we've been very consistent in that, you know, we've, we've established governance of the tech committee and we don't find great value in, in having group discussions about uh, one of issues in say with image desk or things like that. So um, yeah, absolutely. We, we are fully prepared to have an open conversation as, as we always are. But we just aren't prepared to lead the discussion. So I really do need to put that over to you in terms of, okay, what kind of questions would you or the executive have? Um, whether it's clarification on that letter, whether it's other issues, um, but, you know, we're comfortable just having a discussion, but just noting this is not what we understood the meeting to be. No, okay, I understand. Uh, you did get the email that I sent out that had an agenda for today. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So, like, why don't we just go through those lists? Like, I think those are pretty high-level issues sure, that... Right. Uh, you know, we're not going to get into, as you call it, the granular things. We're not going to talk about the one time that the guy did something silly that annoyed everybody. We yep. want to talk about the high-level pictures. So why don't we start off with the grid system? It's something that we've talked about on a number of occasions. And, and in our discussions, guys, uh, we've got some of our members, Ryan and Kieran, that say, hey, it works pretty good for me because I've figured out, you know, how to communicate properly with the image desk and to explain myself. And I'm going, well... Maybe what we really actually need is we need specific training for 
the shops that are not aware how to communicate that information properly. And maybe we need specific training for the image desk people as well so that they understand it. And uh, the discussion that we had, uh, Ryan and Kieran, was not just a, a noon hour lunch and learn where we spend one hour just kind of going over the top issues, but to actually spend like a, a day's training and going through like, what do the photos look like? What does the information look like? What does the grid drawings look like? Is that something that you guys would be open to doing whether, whether you do it through uh, SGI, whether we do it through SAS Polytech, or whether we do it like online situation. Does that make absolutely. sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're open to discussions. And, you know, we've had, Len is our expert, actually, and we're going to, Kieran is just grabbing him as well. We had our computer set up in a way that we thought was going to mitigate the feedback, and it's not. Um, but, you know, I, I think what Len constantly reminds us of, being our expert in the area, is, look, this is intended to be a guideline that's going to work in a lot of the situations. Um, if, if there's a specific request from industry, whether certain members would like more clarity and if it is a matter of training, I mean, absolutely. And, and so Len is just coming in now. So Len, the question was about, you know, what kind of education could we offer uh, some of the industry that may not be comfortable with exactly how to use the grid system, whether it's photos, you know, it's situations where it's gonna work pretty well or where there may be deviations and that kind of thing. I think the big thing with, with the grid system is, is applying it the proper way. I mean, you can have a, a shop requesting uh, three hours on a panel and you might be uh, using the obstructed panel time when actually it should be unobstructed. So when the review desk are looking at it, they may look at the picture and say, well, this isn't a three hour dent, this is a two hour dent. And if it's applied properly by using the unobstructed area instead of the obstructed in the grid system, that's where you come up with your proper times. And I think it's using the appropriate times from the grid system. The grid system is 85% uh, accurate in all cases. And it's, uh, the reason of that is it's only 85% because it doesn't apply sometimes to pillars or inner structures and stuff like that. That's where you would say the grid system can't work properly. But on open panels and uh, different cosmetic panels, it should work 100% all the time. If what we're looking at, yeah, what we're looking at, Len, in particular, would be, uh, and that was the discussion we had. Like some of our shops are saying, "Hey, it works great for me because I know how to, I know how to use it properly. I know how to communicate properly." Some of our shops, we've come to the conclusion they don't understand it and they maybe are not using it properly. So the question was, is it possible that we could arrange a, a training session for the industry and perhaps for Image Desk as well to make sure that everybody understands how it's supposed to work? Just what you just described to us. I would be wondering how many shops out there really actually understood that part of the grid system. So is, is a training session available, do you think? Absolutely, I think it is. Like I say, we, we go through that with our, uh, with our adjusting staff and stuff like our road adjusters and that we show them how to use the grid system and stuff like that. And uh, like I said, it, I think with the grid system, it's, it's understanding it in order to apply it so that, that it works for everybody using it. So you're wondering, Tom, about more of a of an in-person thing? Like, yeah, I don't know. I can't speak to, you know, beyond the, uh, the appraisal handbook, sort of what resources are out there. And so when you said, you know, maybe not a lunch and learn, what, what more might you be looking for? Or do you think some of the shops would benefit from? Is it like an actual in-person or can you elaborate a bit more? Oh, ideally, Ryan, in-person would be the best, you know, where there was a workbook and we could actually maybe take – look at a vehicle and do marking it off or whatever uh, in COVID situation, it's a, maybe a little bit awkward, right? So mm -hmm. maybe we could even do like a, a video series where maybe at the claims tech or at SAS Polytech, you know, somebody could go out and demonstrate exactly, okay, here's, here's what we're looking at. And, you know, in a way, uh, as I'm just talking here, I'm thinking maybe the video one would be cool because people then would see what the pictures look like. And that's what SGI is seeing. They're not seeing the car, they're seeing the photos, right? So. I I wonder if we would be able just to help hone in on this, if we would be able to use um, some surveys of our membership where, you know, again, we've talked about our need to survey the broader membership more, um, the association members, as well as the, the unaffiliated. I wonder if we could use some questions to kind of rein in to get a, a really clear sense of where they'd be looking for more information, whether, like you said, it's specifically photos, because we do have some resources already and have had some tactics and maybe it's just a matter of refining that. But I think that might be helpful for us to get a bit more clarity on exactly where folks may be struggling. So that's absolutely something we can talk about and, and use surveys to get more information on. Yeah. Yep. Well, even, even doing something like what you're talking about, Ryan, where you did a survey and you actually sent out 
several photos of vehicles with grid lines on them and, and ask the shops, tell us what you think the time should be. It'd be interesting to see how many people actually got it 100% right. That would give you a pretty good indication of how well people are able to apply the information, the grid system and how to understand it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, we're, um, we've sort of renewed with, with partnership for the partnership theory with Sean LeBlanc and uh, Troy Kolish. We, we really do want to uh, get a, a more consistent and robust way of getting feedback from industry. And so, yeah, I absolutely, this is something we should absolutely be open-minded to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our concern was that maybe the discussion would be more about, well, the grid system is just wrong and doesn't work. Um, yeah, and like Len says, it's not going to be 100 all the time. Um, but if it's a matter of uh, education can really bring us closer together on that, it seems like it would benefit both sides. Yeah, well, like I think what Leonard said, like, and, you know, he, I don't know how the guys come up with the 85% figure, but it's, it's not right all the time. It's mm -hmm. meant to be a guide for sure. But I think uh, based on the feedback I got from our members, Ryan, some people are finding it, yeah, it's pretty darn close. So uh, mm -hmm. other guys are, are exactly what you said, you know, this thing is silly, don't do it. Well, mm -hmm. maybe it's just an, a really understanding how it's supposed to work would maybe help if we are on the same page. Yep, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and you know, is there an opportunity for us to engage our image review as well um, in this? Ab absolutely. Perfect. We'll go to uh, the next one is number two is the commi um, communications from upper management are not getting down to frontline employees on the image desk. And, and, you know, I think like when we're talking to you and Kieran and Len, you know, we get a pretty good understanding of what's going on. And then the next day, somebody on the image desk doesn't know about that. And uh, I mean, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, you guys would know better than I, but how do we get that information down right to the frontline worker that is uh, working on the image desk? Because sometimes we have an understanding with you guys, or maybe we have a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the image desk, there's a total different understanding. Like the one example that I used was uh, a shop was told that if you're not sure stuff, put it on the sheet, but zero out the cost uh, so that there's no cost attached to it. And then we kind of know it's there. Um, well, he ended up being told that by a manager, then he got a rejection. And that's just one example, I'm not trying to be a specific, but how do we get that information out so that everybody's got it at the same time? Is that possible or is it just human nature that we're gonna have things fall through the cracks? You know, and again, appreciate getting a specific instance. I can't sit here and, and know how common that is. If absolutely, when we're making decisions, information is disseminated down. Um, <laughs> So right now we've got Lyle coming in. We're all piling into one office now on one computer. Lyle, are you able to respond to this? Or? Yeah, uh, Tom, on that particular case, that was a one-off occasion. That was a, uh, a training develop, uh, issue with our uh, image desk appraiser. He just made a mistake at that one time. So it was communicated and he just made a mistake. It was a one-off issue and he made a mistake at that time. So, so he, uh, uh, we, we addressed it. So if there's more occasions of that, let me know, but that was a one-off occasion we dealt with on the on the performance side of things. And yeah. So yeah, I mean, from our side, it's I would be absolutely we would all be concerned if if it felt like oh crap, sorry. Um, if if it seemed like we were consistently not pushing things down, we believe we are. We believe we've got a fairly good process, and and I think talking to some of the members, we've seen um, some of your members. I think have felt some of the changes in terms of us actually flagging opportunities where things weren't on estimates, things like that. So. The, the communication we think isn't a huge issue with us. Are there one ofs? It could very well be, like Lyle said, but as long as you bring those to us, we're able to use them as coaching opportunities. So if, if you've got more examples um, to give us more concern about communication in general, by all means provide them, but we simply haven't been given the evidence that this is a, a recurring thing. Yeah, I think that's a key point on our side, Ryan, is that you know we need to get more specific uh, with claim numbers and situations. Yeah. There. And, and you guys, just to, for the guys in the collision shops out there, I can tell you too that uh, SGI has made some adjustments where rather than rejecting a file, they'll put a note on the file saying, please, you forgot to put mileage or you forgot to put this or, you know, they're asking you for information. When you send in your final print, uh, please put that information on there and the print comes back in and that information is not there. So it works both ways, Ryan. I think, uh, you know, communication, from your guys is going out and it's not getting back to them at the body shop or from the body shops. So it works both ways, folks. 
we've we've got yeah. to both kind of up our game. And Tom, that that one occasion it was it was good feedback to get because we were able to pinpoint exactly where the gap was and we addressed it. We coached that that particular image appraiser and then we adjusted some of our communication protocols internally so that um, they have more access to all the decisions that are made. So we we uh, we have a visual management board that identifies all those types of uh, decisions so that every image appraiser can access it at any time when they're reviewing estimates. So it should be, uh, to, that protocol is put in place to become more consistent as a group. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Well, I'm glad you flagged that. That was one of the changes we've made is, is Lyle and his group do have regular stand-up meetings with staff to make sure that we're directly contacting them about changes, that we're tracking things, uh, emerging issues, things like that. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's perfect every time, but there certainly is effort there to increase that communication. And like you said, if you're able to give us more file numbers, just like this one, we'll look directly into it and find out why and what we can learn from it. Okay, it looks like we have a question. Uh, I'm not sure, do you, is you have to see it on the screen, Evan, or can you tell them or? Hi there, I'm, I'm mute. I actually have a question. So in this particular case, I actually, I'm quite aware how it worked out. The problem that some shops may have is that we don't, not all the shops know that we should maybe zero out those lines, send it through, or some other tweaks that we've made to the system to make files go through. I don't think every shop knows that. And that's something that we should, when there are things changed, that we should let the shops know that so that everybody can follow along so that we don't have issues like this. And, and it's just back to the communication thing. You guys communicating with your employees, you guys found the issue. Great, I appreciate that. But we got to let all the rest of the shops know if that's something that we're going to be doing moving forward, we should all know that. And that way our files can go through and then we can attach appropriate pictures the way that they're supposed to be done. We're, we're, we're good. Oh, so no, thanks, Herb. And, uh, and I guess um, one, one of the reasons that we've done that with some shops, we haven't done it with every shop, is I, I'm just going to be honest and open. Like uh, there, there, there are some shops where we have a high volume of, uh, of requests that are kind of outside the normal policy and, uh, and that we're required to escalate. And uh, with those shops, we're trying to work with them to find a way that we can take the, that we can address their concerns without impacting the, the basically the cycle time for all the other shops in the network. So yeah, we, you know, something, yeah, we haven't widely communicated with it because not every shop needs it. There, there's a handful of shops where we have a very, very high volume of requests and we're trying to work with those shops to, uh, to, to look for solutions to help both themselves and us and uh, our entire network. So um, the answer to that one is we don't need it with everybody right now. Um, we're, we're targeting specific partners, especially high volume partners that we can work with to try to uh, 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 build solutions so we can move those folks along quicker. Good, thanks guys. Thanks Harv. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, number three, if you don't mind. Um, and it's under the topic of post audits. And uh, the industry agrees with reviews being done to deal with issues that are honest mistakes uh, and have been left to an audit person to question, but to, but to have an audit person a, a question repair times that were agreed to months before is not fair. Like we've had situations where, uh, you know, it's a judgment time on a panel repair or whatever. And um, four or five, six months later, they get a phone call saying, we want $1,200 back because we think you charge too much money. Well, now that body shop person has to go out and find that file, pull it up, try and remember what happened six months ago. Um, it takes a fair amount of time for them to get that when they're busy already. Um, you know, is, is it possible that these audits can be dealt with at, at, at maximum, like 60 days at most? Like, a, I don't know. I, I realize maybe there's a certain volume of work, but uh, it's very difficult, especially with some of our shops, that uh, if the owner operator is the guy at the front desk and he's cleaning the shop and he's doing the work and painting the car and then he gets a call like that. And um, it, it's tough for them to come up with all that information. Uh, one of our members made a comment that on a busy big shop, uh, if this continues, we're gonna have to hire a person just to deal with post repair audits and, and get documentation to substantiate our side of it. So is there any way we could clean that up and get it done quicker than four or five or six months down the road? 
So I think you, I think you nailed, I'm going to let Kieran give a more detailed answer here, but I think you nailed it there, Tom, was saying that, yeah, the administration is key and, and we're going to be absolutely consistent and steadfast in our, our, um, in the concept that the file does need to speak for itself and the documentation. So administration really is, is, um, important maybe more than ever in, in collision repair but specifically with the timelines you're talking about i'll let your own respond yeah no i um no, and that's a, a good question i know this is starting to become more and more we're getting more and more questions around audit and uh and because well we're, we're trying to transition towards audit uh you know that back end review uh try to get out of the way as much as possible in front of the in front of the uh the files that's in progress so one of the things though first thing with the audit is that um, I think we need to clarify, we will not audit or request recoveries on a file that's gone through at Escalated. If it's dealt with at our Escalated image review, it's done. There's no going back on it. We are not going back and questioning it. If it has happened, I, I'd like to know about it. <laughs> and so would Lyle. Um, where, where we may go back and discuss a repair time, and a couple of things, is it has to be black and white. Um, if there is a judgment time item and it's not supported by the documentation, and it hasn't gone through escalated, so it basically went through image. And again, image is not looking at those to any to any real extent. They're looking at it maybe through a, through a, um, um, there as we mentioned before. They're doing a cursory review of the file. We've said this since day one. Any file that goes through image is perfect candidate for audit because it's not audited. It's a cursory review. It's a check. It's a filter. If it goes through escalated, then absolutely we are not going to come back and uh, come after a, a, a judgment time review that's been through there. We do not go after judgment times on audit. If you are being approached about a judgment time item that's gone through image or that, that's bypassed image or, or the cursory review through image, it's because it is not supported. You have not supplied documentation to support it. It has to be black and white or, or we're not gonna ask you for it. So if it is, if we are asking for something, it means that there is a fundamental issue in the file. It is not supported. Um, when it comes to the timing, one of the things basically right now, we, we take in a superset of data monthly. So you finish a file September 1st. We don't get that information because so if you finish the file, I mean like, like pay it in September, we see it in October, right? October 15th. We put it through a filter, a risk filter, a matrix. We put it to our, to our auditors. They, they will then take those files and during for basically that August, October, November timeframe. So this is September file. We get the files in October because that's, they come in once a month and they're filtered for paid files. And we get them the 15th of the month, the following month that they're paid just through, through Mitchell. Um, we then look at the file. We're on, we, we, we do the audits that, you know, October, November timeframe. And then that's when we start calling. And if there is something, if there's a recovery or a concern, we call up the shop, we review the results with the shop, either in person or on the phone. So Kieran, can I ask you right there? So, and to Tom's point, because it, on the surface, it sounds uh, like a compelling argument. Well, we're looking at something several months down the road, but I think what you're saying is that initial communication to revisit that file is happening around the two month mark. It should be happening within that two to three month mark, for sure. The final letter. And the letter may be later, we're asking for the money, but the discussion with the auditor that completed the audit should be happening sooner. And um, and maybe there, I'm sure there's cases where it isn't, but in general, that that's our target. And the reason for that obviously is no request is made to the shop for recovery until that discussion happens. And the reason for that is maybe we missed something. <laughs> Maybe the shop's got a fantastic reason for asking what they asked for. We need to know. And uh, so that's our opportunity to connect with the shop. And if there is a concern still, and if, listen, guys, they, they, this, this is a very small fraction of the audits we're talking about when we're talking about uh, um, uh, recoveries on judgment times. Vast majority of them are things like uh, double entries, uh, you know, uh, multiple files where there's multiple claims, the same file, uh, errors, counting clerical errors, right? Charging is twice for a part, something like that. That's really what it is. Okay, no, that sounds well, good. Is that, is that reasonable though, Tom? Like, again, I don't want, um, and it, it was educational for me as well, you know, this idea of, well, are we really sending a letter six months later? And then, okay, I felt a lot better when I understood that, well, no, the dialogue has been occurring for several months to that point. And so is, is that, uh, you know, when you're saying it'd be ideal if we could have, you know, within 60 days, if we're having that initial conversation where you know we're asking to go back and look at that file around that two month mark is, is that how does that land with you well you know i haven't heard from anybody yet that they did get a, a comment two months 
out from the thing. It's very possible that they did, but uh, you and I both know not everybody reads all their emails, right? Uh, I don't know. I got the comments I'm getting is that guys are, you know, all of a sudden they're getting a letter out of nowhere. No, maybe they yep. weren't paying attention. Uh, but if that's, what the case, you know, if that's the case, maybe there's an opportunity for, for themselves and we can clarify sort of how that works. But um, yeah, that's not how our process should, should work at all. Yeah. No, it's good to and, know. Okay. And Tom, it's, it's Lal here. Um, I can shed some light on that. The, the direction for our auditors is um, there should be no recovery if they have not had a conversation with the shop. There might be, with COVID, there might be tough to have those conversations. They might be through email, but there has to be some, some discussion and uh, confirmation from the shop, whether they understood or whatever it might be. Uh, because that, that, after that protocol happens, then they document the discussion and, and then the, uh, once they document the discussion, they put it in a file and it actually comes to me. So there, that's why there's a, probably a gap between the discussion and, their, and the letter again sent out because I'll review it with the senior appraiser that's uh, responsible for audit and we'll go through each and every one. And I, I specifically asked the question, was there a call at the shop? What did they talk about? What was the discussion? Were they in agreement? And if there is any gap in there, then I send it back and they have to continue following up. If I'm comfortable with the answer, then that's when the letter goes out. So, so uh, the audit doesn't even start until probably about two months after it's been paid. And then once the audit's done, there's the expectation that there's a conversation with the shop and then it gets to me. So there's probably, an, between the conversation in the shop but, and the generation letter, there's probably another month just because it goes through uh, my review and and if I'm not comfortable with the recovery or with the discussion then we won't even send the letter out so uh, I'll take a look at it uh, final before it, it go everything goes out and but but yeah for sure if there is any recovery letter that there is no discussion with the shop and pre-COVID we are recording every single discussion so it doesn't come to my desk unless there is a recording of that discussion um, with COVID with our auditors working from home, some of them working from home still, we don't have the ability to record a lot of the conversations. So sometimes we'll send an email just for confirmation. Um, but they are, uh, for the ones that are, are working in the office, we're recording every single call. So um, that's how we're tracking those, those conversations. And there will be no recovery unless there is a discussion. And I was, I was very clear with the audit group on that. No, oh, thank you, Lyle. I appreciate that explanation. Um, we do have a question uh, coming up online here, if uh, we could get that set up, Evan. Harv, you ready to go? Yeah, there we go. Imagine hearing from me again. Uh, Ryan's laughing. So when you get the audit done, which actually I have to say that I was one of those fortunate people, there's some files that is going to take me a while to get cleared up missed a wheel alignment check or something that I'm trying to get a hold of a client, get it through. Once I have that stuff done, which is taking me longer because now we making sure that everything's on the file. So our administrative thing is, is adding up and trying to get rentals. And I, I think working with SGI, this wasn't a bad process for, for myself. It, it really upset me uh, because it was a ton of files and burnt up a lot of my time. Um, it was a learning experience, however, I would recommend any shop that's on here to make sure that you have everything in place. And for myself, I'm an owner operator. I do pretty much a little bit of everything, including running the towing end, which that's where I've met Troy before. But I have a front office girl that's pretty much going through every file to make sure every invoice, everything is attached and is burning up a ton of time. So I, I don't know, that's something that we're gonna have to look at for something down the road. And of course, it protects SGI, both SGI and the shop and the client, so that when the client says, hey, my car broke down, you guys are at fault, we have a scan, it's set up. Nothing's perfect, but my experience doing the audit came kind of a, quite suddenly, I kind of really didn't expect it. Um, and some of the triggers that make it happen kind of surprised me because I'm in that high volume a lot of like a big hits like deer hits out in the rural area and, and a lot of uh 
supplement requests. We call them rejection supplement requests, whatever they be. I get seem to get a lot of those. And so we're trying to come up with a way where we can get that stuff through. So my name's not always flagging on some manager's desk looking what is Harv up to again. Um, and I don't want to be that guy, but it all in all, we, we have to make sure that that we can recover something for all the administrative time we spent to make sure that everything's there. And it's not super easy. It's easy for guys that have estimators and, and front office people and the people that really understand the system. But when you're training somebody, just that is pretty much their job, just to make sure everything's attached to the file because you're walking in and out of the paint booth, walk into the frame machine or whatever. That's something that we're gonna have to go down that road and look at. That's, that's pretty much where I'm going with this. So my audit thing was interesting. It was eye-opening and um, hopefully, well, we haven't, don't seem to have as many rejections, which is kind of surprising. I'm kind of just like, really, I went through? <laughs> I'm like, wow. Um, anyways, that's my thought. We're gonna have to look at something for that. Um, that's down the road, something for discussion. Good points, sir. Um, really good points, actually. And again, we're kind of, I think we're, we're circling around the concept that administration is, again, more important than ever. When I've talked to a couple of, of uh, shops recently who, you know, because there's a spectrum who honestly say they haven't had the issues with image desk, they really seem to put a lot of effort and emphasis, like you were saying, exactly on the administration of that. Um, so, yeah, I think you're bang on about that. Good. And that was good, good comments too, Ryan and Harv, and, and I appreciate that. And, and the auditors will try and work with the shops during kind of the audit process as best we can. And, and what we noticed, like as, as Kieran mentioned, um, the audits, that, all the claims that get on the audit package, it's, it's based on an automated filter of our risk criteria. So we don't look at specific shops, we look at the criteria and it's, it spits out answers. But, um, and with SCORP and, and safe and quality repairs, uh, stuff like uh, the scanning will, will, will pop up. And, and that's the one thing that we've noticed lately, a lot of gaps on is, is the con completion and the documentation of the scanning. And that, that's, again, as Harv mentioned, it protects us just as much as, as the shop too. We want to make sure those get done. We'll work with you to, to kind of get the documentation in or get the vehicles back in and, and uh, get them scanned just so that we, we ensure there is evidence in the file that it has been done just in case something happens along the road. But the auditors will, um, we, we're focused on the, the uh, customer experience and, and you guys being our customer and, and, and uh, trying to be uh, respectful in our communication and respectful of your time. And, and we're not going to try and, and uh, demand things be done right away tomorrow. Um, we understand that you guys have a business and, and you're repairing vehicles at the same time. So we'll work with you on time frames just to get those things addressed. But, but uh, the auditors are, are really focused on re really the process the, is to help help the shops going forward. And, the, and that's why we have those communications. And that's why I enforce it for auditors to have those calls with the shop, especially if there's recoveries, is we want to use it as a coaching opportunity so that it doesn't happen going forward. And, and even when a shop gets a letter, um, and if we notice on an audit the next month that the same thing has happened, well, we we keep that in consideration that we expect you guys to change behavior after you get the letter. So um, if there's audits that come up in a month later and the same issue occurs, we don't hit you even harder because we, we know that you haven't had an opportunity to make, make the necessary changes. So we're pretty uh, uh, focused on kind of coaching you guys getting better and getting ready for kind of the new accreditation agreement uh, in 2021. Good. Thanks, Lyle. Thanks, Ryan and uh, Harv. Thank you again for your comments there. Um, going to number four, and it's actually, I got a note here from somebody in the room here. It kind of dovetails into what we're discussing in item number four. And the, the note I got was, if we have an issue with a file, be it an adjuster or an estimate, who exactly do we call? You know, we haven't really got that go-to person yet. We're kind of looking at that. Uh, it said, nobody seems to want to deal with anything and rarely ever answers the phone or returns email. And please don't blame COVID-19 is what is written on the bottom here. But uh, the, the point is, is that 
uh, I think this, and I'll just touch on two in this other one, and number four is that uh, we understand that there is a process to uh, escalate the file uh, and do a review on it, that kind of stuff. That's, that's cool. But if we have questions, like who can we call? Is there a phone number? Is there a go-to guy? Who do you want us to be talking to? And whether it's on the file repair or on the estimate, who do we talk to? No, fair point here. I'm going to maybe speak to more of the ask versus accept the number four afterward. I'm going to ask Kieran to speak to more of the communication piece, recognizing that I appreciate the opportunity you've given us to get some information from the surveys. Um, it's a work in progress. You're absolutely right. But hopefully Kieran can get a bit more clarity here. Hey guys, um, so first things first is uh, you're absolutely right. We apologize uh, <laughs> unreservedly that there is, that there are challenges, especially around total losses. Um, it's, uh, it's, that process is broken and we're fixing it. Uh, it's got nothing to do with COVID. It's got nothing to do with anything else. It is, it is just a, uh, it, it's, it's a process that has, that has been damaged. So, um, interestingly, we partner directly with our claims operations team. So Dennis McKaylock and his group, and they are, they are in the process right now of getting changes made to our system. That's actually going to put some checks into our claims management system that will prevent a file from closing without getting in touch to the shop first. So, um, and letting them know that that discussion's happened. We're also looking for options to, uh, uh, you know, to get in front of those shops, especially, uh, you know, even kind of nearly the same time that we're getting in touch with the customer or having a, a challenge, an opportunity to talk directly with, uh, uh, with the shop when right, right when that TL decision is being made so that we understand where the file is in its progress. Because especially when these are, like during COVID, uh, you folks have, uh, have taken on a lot more uh, um, total loss processing for us. Thank you very much. And uh, as part of that, this process really brought to light some gaps in the total loss management process because there are now more files than ever going TL at a shop. And so uh, we are, there's communication going on basically as we speak to the adjuster threes around the province uh, and these process changes being made in GIS. You need to, you should be seeing a substantive difference in, in how well those files are managed going forward. Now, when it comes to a question on a file, specifically on the very back cover of the appraisal policy manual, there is the name of every, every, uh, um, every person that works in appraisal services that's on the image and audit team and the seniors. If you've got a challenge on a file and you want to talk about it, it's very important that you reach out either to the, to the appraisal's exceptions desk, specifically for things like unrelated damage. Um, there also, do we also have a whole team of folks? We have our, our operate, we have our senior appraiser team. So that we've got Birch Hansen, we've got, um, Kemba Haychuk, uh, uh, Rob, Bob, Bob Rosalute and, uh, Terrence. Terrence Palaszczuk. We've also got our entire, um, the entire uh, shop relations team that, you know, in worst case, if you're really struggling with something, you know, um, hopefully you can give Gerald or Tom a call if you need to. There's also our management team um, within our group. So there, there's quite a number of resources available. Um, again, these would be looking for issues specific where there's, they're not managed by policy. I mean, I'll tell you right now, if you're looking, if you're, if you've got a masking issue, <laughs> And, uh, you know, you're looking to, you believe that maybe that, uh, that, that our policy doesn't necessarily, there, there's a specific situation, you believe that there's maybe more opportunity for masking time. Um, I, you know, those types of questions, um, we'll certainly be happy to listen to them at things like the, at, at, uh, at our title committee level. If you put those through image and you're outside the policy, you will be getting supplement request. And, and if you go through and, and, and reach out to us outside of the technical committee on some of those kind of global issues where you believe that there's a, you know, you don't agree with this policy or this policy, those need to go to tech committee. If you, we're really talking about those really unique one-offs where it's a, it's a, and, and there is a, and there is an issue that's holding up your specific claim. Those are the ones that we want to hear about from the operational side. Good. Good. So I, I think you might recall, Tom, when uh, my role has changed um, almost a few months ago now, part of the reason of, of uh, removing that separation we had from appraisals, salvage claims tech, and claims operations and bringing them together was so we could look at the process more seamlessly. And so, yes, very specific changes pending. Just yesterday, I was reviewing some of the criteria and why we feel we need the system change for the PDA process. We've talked a bit about how we're actually looking at, at a very, very significant systems change in our back end. Basically, um, 
It's called digital transformation, moving to an entirely new system. And so we're in this, this ugly interim where we're limiting changes to the current system to those that are deemed critical. And I think that PDA process, because we found out through your surveys was such a pain point for partners, is a critical change. So we're absolutely working on that. Um, the communication piece, like Kieran said, if, if people are using the numbers and not getting a response, please give us those examples because again, those are, are really valuable coaching opportunities. Um, also going along with this digital transformation and this idea that we're going to be redeveloping or, or getting entirely new systems, we are looking at the entire first notice of loss process, how we structure work of adjusters and how the workflow is going to be. We recognize we want a, an improved customer and partner experience. And so, um, you know, this all has to happen very systematically and very planfully um, in terms of how a new system is going to work, but it should be driven by how our processes should work. And the information we've got from you in terms of those pain points does inform how we're going to structure the work down the road. So uh, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time and we'll keep picking away when you give us things like PDA that we can make some inroads on, we're gonna keep doing that. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic because we found out that's such a pain point for you that again, we have driven this home with adjusters and we're, we're pushing really hard to get that system changed. So um, yeah, I think that's what we would say about the communication piece. Appreciate the patience uh, on that. Um, you know, and, and do you want to go right into ask versus accept or did you, did you have any kind of an intro on that one or? Well, no, just uh, we cut, you kind of hit on a lot of those points. And uh, I, I think the key thing is uh, if we have a problem with the uh, uh, estimate side of the equation, those names are at the back of the uh, appraisal manual, which nobody looks at, but the odd person, right? Um, maybe I need to send out a, a, an actual memo to our members, but I'm, I'm still a little confused if I have an appraisal. I, I keep calling Dennis McKay like I feel bad. I, nope. Every time there's an appraiser issue, I call Dennis, and he gets it handled really well. He's very good. Um, but is there a number for our members, or do they got to just keep calling me, and I call Dennis? I, what do you want me to do there? You know, ideally, they will call the numbers in the book, and if – um, you know, I, I think we have the opinion that it's kind of clear from the policy handbook of who's responsible for what. Um, but if, if you are giving a reasonable time and not getting a response, like obviously a, a 30 minute uh, wait uh, probably is a little unreasonable. But if you're waiting uh, days, if you feel it's unreasonable and you want to escalate to whether it's Dennis or to one of our appraisals management, please do. Because again, that's a coaching opportunity for us. Dennis is able when you call him to push it down and find out why did he need to get called? And the same thing on the appraisal side. And so I think we'd rather kind of just stay the course on those the contacts that are given in the handbook, keep flagging issues with us, and we'll keep uh, keep coaching with the, where we need to. Har Harv's back again. He, won't, he just won't go away. So hang on, I got a question from Harv. Don't ever feel bad, Harv. Yeah, <laughs> so back many years ago in July, I did that pilot project, the ACE program, where we did the estimating thing. We did everything, including write-offs. We did like the whole issue. Man, you remember that? Yeah. Part of the deal is a lot of times shops know that this car is on the edge of being written off and it needs a PDA done. So we always put in pictures of PDA. When I did it, there was actually a form that I filled out that I checked off from the, whoever, whatever company you use. And there was a, a diagram of what uh, instructions on how to mark a car. Would that be something that would help SGI if the shop to do that? Because you're going to pay us to do the estimate if it's written off. And if we do the PDA, that might be something that might help SGI come up with a more fair value of the vehicle. And then we don't have the client questioning, are they doing it from pictures? Are they doing it from, from you know, how are they getting up, you know, everything from, you know, taking pictures of tires, measuring tires. I know it seems like more work for the shops, but if it's a client that really wants the car fixed and then you go through it, you know, you snap the appropriate pictures of the auctions it has, and you and it's just it was just a short form. I think it was a page, two pages that I would fill out and send back with the file. Then it would, whenever it went to the guys at the lot of province claims, I guess, uh, like the guys like Justin and stuff, they would just go through that and they'd be able to come up with a value that was more reasonable. Um, however, in saying that, the information I had, I went by what the PDA thing said. And a lot of times my values were higher than what the SGI appraisers would mark down when they're at my shop. And, and I was just going by the information I got. That's just a side note, but it might be something that might help both our client and SGI come up with a, a more reasonable value. It's just my comment on that. 
PDA. Oh, no, I, I, and I appreciate that. So what, what you were filling out is actually the PDA form. <laughs> uh, it's the pre-damage assessment. So when we go to get a value on a vehicle, right now we're working with Autotex. And so what happens is, is um, we write it, you need an estimate and you need a value and you compare them. <laughs> And if the estimate is a certain value, uh, if it's right now 75% uh, of, uh, of the actual cash value, then, then we write it off. So we, what, this, what the PDA is, the pre-damage assessment, is determining what was the value of the vehicle prior to the accident. So that form you're filling out, it probably had conditioning questions in it as well, right? And questions like, are there cigarette burns <laughs> on the seats? You know, stuff like this that is not accident related. And the idea behind that was to determine what the value of that vehicle was. So yes, uh, when you were doing the ACE program, you were actually a full DRP facility. So you were doing full direct repair, you were doing, you were doing PDAs, you were doing everything. We're not there yet in Saskatchewan, like we haven't taken that leap. Um, and, uh, but that said, we are relying on the photos that are taken. And I know that photo shops are getting questions uh, from adjusters and uh, appraisers asking them for, hey, could you grab a couple more photos of the interior for us? Because we're trying to do that PDA over the desk at, you know, after the fact. So uh, you know, if that's something that industry would be would willing to help us out with, then we can certainly give you guys some more tips on what's in that form and what those pictures that we really need are. Um, and that would sort of be that, that next step, I guess. Uh, we don't want to add any more admin to you folks right now. That, that is one of the challenges. That PDA process is done you know, it's, it's done in-house, but it's something I know for a fact is something we were talking about even not that long ago, right, Herb? About yeah. essentially looking for opportunities for shops to even do potentially help us out with some PDAs. We're just, we're not there right now. I, I think it's Len here. Yeah, I, I think. got paid for that, though, so that was a good thing. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Herb, it's Len here. Uh, it gets back to when we started the ACE program was the accuracy of filling out those PDA sheets because it not only affects the shop or SGI, but it also affects the customer. It affects all of us because if you're doing the PDA and you put down the car's got 80,000 kilometers on it, we get one value back Modotex. And then we may, we may say the car is repairable, then we find out it's got 180,000 Ks on it. So now all of a sudden we're in the of total loss of this car because the value changes. It could also work the opposite way. So we're back, we're back to the accuracy of the admin, just like we're talking about here with the estimating and the, and the review desk and stuff like that. So I think the, the accuracy of the admin on the PDAs is very, very important for everybody involved, the customer, the shop, and SGI. I, I would agree with that, but like in, in my case, it was uh, Gary Paulson came out and asked me, well, why are your values coming back so high? And I said, well, I just followed the list that Autotech sent out and I mark it according to the list. And I showed him a couple I did. He said, well, yeah, you're right. And they actually came back a little bit higher. It's just kind of the way I followed the list and, it was some, and there was no interpretation. You know, one to three cigarette burns or whatever it was on the headliner, it was pretty simple. Just so you know, that yes, it is possible, and but remember, I did get a little bit for it, so that's all I got in that. Well, the, the doing PDA sheets and stuff like that on the cars can be interesting. I'll give you a story. Yeah, <clears throat> I had an appraiser that every time we got a brand new car in, he would rate it poor, and the value would come back terrible. So I was getting a lot of complaints on it. So I asked him, "Well, how? Why are you rating this car as poor?" He said, "Well, I can't rate it good, Len, because the car is all smashed up." So there's all these little things that come into how you rate a car and, and how to understand how to rate a car. I said, I know, I know it's smashed up, it's a, but it wasn't before the accident. You probably made that guy a manager now. So anyway. <laughs> Brian, is that you? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, speaking of that ask versus accept, Ryan, we talked about it a little bit there. Um, and, it, and it goes on to other things. But one of the comments we got from one of our members is, how come every time I get a letter, and a, and a demerit every time I make a mistake. Why can't uh, every time SGI makes an honest mistake, why can't we give them a letter and at the end of the year we trade off one for one? And I mean, they're not trying to take a, a poke at you or nothing, but I'm just saying, you know, why does it always work one way? Like, uh, you know, shops make uh, mistakes that sometimes in some cases are honest mistakes and they, they get dinged for it. Uh, SGI, I don't think they go out of the way to make mistakes, but it happens. Uh, can we, can we uh, kind of trade off one for one, or is that a dumb idea? I'll give you a bit of a response, but Len's going to first, yeah. You know, you know Tom, uh, in answer to that, uh, I, I don't think the shops realize that when we do find out our staff make a mistake, it is certainly brought to their attention, and it's, it, it's probably a little more a, a stern uh, conversation than it is when we talk to the shops about a mistake. Great. 
Can we get um, can we get one of our mistakes absolved though? <laughs> That's what we're asking. We're looking for a little grace here. That's a good point. You know, it's funny. We when we do our own employee engagement surveys, that's a really good point, Lanny. You know, every year we always get some people saying, "Well, you know, management needs to do more performance management, you know, and more disciplining of staff." But if we're doing it right, staff don't know, and and shops don't know. We don't want you knowing if we're really coming down and working with someone. Um, and that's not fair to them. We don't want their credibility hurt. So thanks, Len. Yeah, those, those conversations and, and, and Len is a, a great influencer. We, we need to get better. We need to coach our people, but we can't be, we need to be stern as well. But on the concept of ask versus accept, um, you know, I, I don't know if we've done a great job of really being clear about we are aligned. We want to find a way to get out of the way of, of, of shops. And with the responsibilities we've got for, you know, our financial responsibilities, you know, we're stewards of a significant expense. You know, we, we, we repair about $330 million worth of cars every year. We write off about $240 million. This is significant responsibility to the public and our customers. I mean, um, obviously we're in the paper recently about, you know, the, the scale of our operations. And so we are absolutely committed to finding a way to do that. And the question is, and where we're now going to be engaging the associations and the broader membership is, okay, with our new KPI model, how does it work? And I'll be really honest, and when I first took this role and, and came here and, and talking with Len, we've had a lot of conversations about our concerns with the KPI model. And the KPI model, to me, is fundamentally flawed in that we bundle together all these different measurements about parts usage and about cycle time and, and things like that. And they're all very different. They're very different measures. But the single consequence right now of your score is whether or not you get some uh, autonomy and some auto approval through image desk and that value simply is not meaningful the, the 3500 whatever we want to use it's it doesn't fit because what if we have a partner who's really struggling on parts usage you know the OE percentage is way too high does it really make sense that the consequences of that is is we essentially slow them and the rest of the industry down by plugging up image desk that doesn't make sense at least on the surface to us and so we've been having all these conversations about, okay, well, what is the appropriate um, performance system that we're going to have? And that's why we're, we're talking with you now, and we'll be talking a bit tomorrow about what we want to use for a new key performance indicator model. And the most linear sort of thought is, okay, you know, we've got this, this responsibility to ensure we have controls in place. And if shops demonstrate, as many do, that they're doing their best, that they're being honest, that they're abiding by the policies, then the consequence of that should very clearly be, okay, we can trust the shop and we should be able to apply a higher level of auto approved through image desk. And, and speaking with some members recently, or, or what I thought was a brilliant idea, perhaps when we do catch something in image desk, like, you know, what's that number going to be? Is it going to be 10,000? Is it going to be 20,000? We've heard from a lot of members that they don't want a ridiculously high auto approve because they like the idea of that cursory check. They don't want to be way out on an estimate. And so maybe it's a combination of a higher number. And also if we do catch something, say it's a few hundred dollars or, or whatever the value is, that's part of the trust as well. Like we've been doing recently in terms of, okay, if there's something minor missing on an estimate, let's let it go through and trust that the shops are gonna, uh, gonna comply and adjust the estimate after the fact. We're sitting at about 65, 35. We still have about 35% of the time where shops aren't going back. We're trusting them to do something and they aren't doing it. Um, but we want to get to that. And that's where the discussions are, are going to be happening in the next, in the very short term here and with all of industry about, okay, you know, what do the measures, what should they look like? What should the values be? If someone does have an issue with parts usage, okay, to me, it doesn't make sense to us rather that, okay, we're just going to bog down image desk. There should be different conversations about how we can work with that repairer to make sure they're doing the most cost effective repair. Um, because that's more consistent with how you change that behavior. So, you know, ask versus accept. We are committed to a measure like that. We need to have, we need to be able to demonstrate that we've done our diligence and the trust is there. And, and the flip side is we do have members that, that um, are trying to push advancements through image desk. And again, that's why we have governance and a tech committee. And we really need to change that behavior because the consequence of, of certain members, because it's certainly not everyone, the consequence of that is image desk slows down for everyone. And that's why we have the process and the governance set up at the tech committee, where when there's new emerging developments, like I'm proud of, of the work Len and Kiron have done in terms of being, I think the first insurer to recognize some of the well testing. 
um, you know, the, the masking, the, the tech community, the associations, I think have done very well at pushing some of these agendas and that keeps us, I think, on the forefront of many insurers in terms of looking at these things. Um, and that's the right form for that. There's always going to be a list. It's hard to prioritize everything. I mean, you can't prioritize everything. But the flip side is we can't have this alternative process where we're trying to push it through image and it has a negative consequence for everyone. So, um, so they are related. Again, we are committed to getting out of the way and that the questions now are more practical in terms of what does that look like? And there needs to be some form of trust measurement. Now, do we want to measure that, that ultimately punishes the shop for a simple transgression? No, there has to be a long enough baseline and a, and a reasonable threshold where a shop makes a mistake. They don't all of a sudden fall out of being trusted to not being trusted. Um, and so those are the practical discussions we need to have now. So we're absolutely aligned on recognizing some shops are very high performance. But at the same time, we're, just because a shop may have a really, really good cycle time doesn't mean that like, we could never defend to the public, well, this shop had a really good cycle time, so we never audit any of those files and we let everything go through image desk. That's not linear. Um, so that, that's why the trust measure is, is so critical. Yeah. I think with the ask versus accept too, with all the emerging technology, Ryan, like um, that, that uh, exceptions desk is probably going to be leaned on more heavily than it has in the past. And um, I agree with you, like we shouldn't be plugging up image desk because that's maybe not the place for that. But uh, are, are you guys seeing a lot of stuff go to exceptions or is it an area that we can expand the use of that? Because there's so many new things like we're guys reading OEM repair procedures in it. I was talking to one guy, he's, he's working on a particular um, uh, Nissan product and it said to change every bolt. You know, check it all apart and make sure it's good and then change every bolt. You can only use it once. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if he puts that through image desk, they're going to say, get lost. Don't be silly. But it, maybe that needs to go to exceptions. Like I'm just saying, is that the process? Is that what you'd like to see more of so oh, we don't absolutely. have problems? So, you know, and I can't speak to the volume. I don't think the volume is, is incredibly high at this point. But what I can say is, Every day we have, uh, you know, it's funny how the, the pandemic changed things and now we rely on Microsoft Teams and we have a, a, a chat with our technical folks and Len is, I would say, sort of the, the moderator, the grandfather of sorts. Um, and every day there are discussions that are happening there and I, I like reading them just for interest about exactly what you're saying, how to, how to deal with some of those specific things. I'm not sure, Len, if you'd elaborate any yeah. more on that. No, but. no I agree. I, I, I think we're going to keep on having those discussions because in our industry, it's never going to be cut and dried. Every job is not going to be repaired the same or the OEM repair procedure is not going to be interpreted the same by every shop we're dealing with. And I think we have to have, and like I said, both shop reps work under my supervision and I want them open line of communication all the time because there's always going to be second opinions. Yep. Oh, that's good. Good to know. Um, oh, and, and just to that, Tom, I just want to respond to one more thing there. Um, when, when, when we, if we've got a, for example, um, a, a policy where for right now we've got, I'm going to use an example, those Honda panels and, ref, and the refinishing the backside of the panel. Um, we, we currently today provide a, uh, uh, an, under, uh, an undercoating uh, uh, provision and, we, and there's an allowance specifically to do, deal with burn through and any, any other elements that are in there. Um, when you've got a new issue like that, that pops out, and it did, and it was it was it was something that we were not aware of, and that's why we were lean on the tech committee to identify those. Those are things that we we're going to have to start dealing with through the technical committee to go through and 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 go through image and add in a, a say that you're literally going to epoxy prime and and actually apply color to the back of a panel is that doesn't that doesn't belong in image. That doesn't belong in an escalated review queue either. That is a discussion because that is a departure from our policy, and we need to understand what the AOEM is coming to, we get it, bring them along to the table. And those are things that we have planned. And I know that working closely with our technical, technical group here, those are things that we want to work through. It's, it, it is going to be an issue, right? When we already have an allowance to cover, you know, the, the uh, um, corrosion protection on the back of a, uh, on the back of a panel, it, it really kind of, it, it goes, it, it, I, I guess we need to understand what are we paying for? What are we not paying for? It's not just an automatic, let's do it. Um, there are safety elements that, um, you know, the, some of these, some of these elements that they come up that, you know, we've been pretty clear with our guys where it directly contributes to the safety of a, of a panel. It's a diagnostic element or whatever. Um, you know, we're continuing to work with those. Some of those can't wait. They got to get dealt with right away and, and we will, but you know, we, we got to, we, we have to be, we have, we have, we, we our policy covers the 90%. 
There's going to be elements that are outside of it, a 0.1 or a 0.2 here or there. We will work with those. But again, there, 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 is, a pat, there is a channel, there, there is a place for those to be discussed. And uh, so I just wanted to, to put that clarification out there. I, I sure. just want to talk quickly about the Honda that uh, Karen brought up because we've had some inquiries about that. And, and, and I'm going to be d uh, dealing directly with Honda on that because I have some issues with them. Um, in their procedures, they tell you to uh, lay the panel on the box that it comes in and, and put your epoxy primer on and stuff like that. The problem I have is that what happens to where you're welding the quarter panel on up at the sail panel and you're burning all that epoxy primer and all the e-code back off? How is, how is that epoxy helping where you're burning it off? Or if you're going to glue the panel on, you have to grind all that stuff back off in order to put your, pa your panel bonding on. Uh, I, I'm struggling with that, with that procedure, and I, and I plan on taking it up with Honda for an explanation on that. Because very seldom you'll have rust in the middle of a quarter panel because it come, they come e-coated from the factory. But the problem is, is where you're burning it off when you're welding it on, or where you're grinding it off to put your panel bonding on. What, what's, the, what, what's the advantage of putting the epoxy primer on those areas? And that's where you're going to have your corrosion at most of the time, where you're welding or where you're grinding the stuff off. Good point. We may have to get a bit more involved with the OEMs, and we have a couple of the OEMs going to be talking tomorrow. So uh, as we make those connections, then I think it's a good idea. Like, okay, why are we doing that? Because yeah, uh, what you're saying makes sense. And I think that the, the OEMs, they welcome stuff like that. We went through that with Toyota. Do you remember when we did the town hall meetings there? Uh, there was a discussion about Toyota says, do not put inserts in where you butt weld. Yep. Well, I never quite agreed with that because when, when you weld, when you butt weld and, and, and you, you weld and then a guy goes to grind that weld off, how much metal have you got left where that weld was there? Now Toyota changed their stand and says, no, we, we do recommend you put, you put inserts or sleeves inside because it does get weak where you weld it there. So... We have to work with all parties involved. Yeah. Yep. No, it sounds good. Well, we'll keep moving here because we're getting close to our time here. And I hope I haven't taken too much of your thunder from uh, your Saturday morning presentation. But um, number five is talking about better communication documentation is needed on both sides. Uh, shops require more information on dispatch claims, things like deductibles, better descriptions of the damage, uh, whether or not the customer has replacement cost insurance, and of course, liability. Uh, the final comment on that is that some of our smaller shops, you know, I, we've talked about this before, you know, these guys are running a business, fixing the cars, painting the cars, cleaning the cars, running the office, and doing their paperwork at the end of the day or on weekends. Uh, is there some kind of a short checklist that could be provided saying, before you send this file in, have you got, and then the list of items that you want to see. So to two questions there is that, can we get more information from you guys up front? And is it possible that there's a way you could help us get the information you need when the job is done. Yes, absolutely. Um, we'd be happy to hear uh, if, if you know if that's something that you guys could provide us with. Uh, it's something we can work with our adjusters on, um, and to ensure that you know you guys are getting getting the information that you need. It's not lost on us that you're you're our, you're our rep, your agent. And you're writing that estimate for us. You are, uh, you know, you're doing. It's incredibly important to us, and uh, and we need to support your efforts in that. And the net, this is this kind of interesting, but it's the one area where even our you know, our staff appraisers have some of the same struggles you folks do because we get those same notes when we write our estimates, and when they're missing some of those key elements, yeah, we're doing a lot of phone calls, and trying to work, you know, to, to try to find out what's um, uh, you know some more details on the claim so we can do an, an, an accurate estimate. Just a couple of things right now. The replacement cost should never be an issue. That is an automated process. So um, right now it's either, it's automatically attached to every dispatch through GIS, or it's also on every staff written estimate, it's clearly stated in, in the claim. So it shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, the replacement cost indicator. Um, again, when it comes to the adjuster and the GST, one of the biggest problems we have with GST guys is that, you know, you know who makes the claim? The driver on a commercial vehicle, not the owner. And then we go, hey, what's the GST? I don't know. So, so the problem is we don't know until we actually get in touch with the actual commercial vehicle, like the owner of the vehicle or, or the registrar. That's when the GST percents get updated. That's why it's so important to check ePay because that's where it'll show up. And uh, now, but the one thing that we did is accident circumstance. So this is, from my perspective, this is our biggest opportunity. Um, 
like I mentioned, this just tells you about everything that happened, where we believe the dam, where the, where the area of impact was, any other elements that might contribute to understanding what happened with the claim. So maybe I've got a, an impact the front corner, but did the vehicle spin around and hit a guardrail? You know what I mean? All these kinds of things that need to be kind of addressed. And um, so, yes, we're very interested in hearing that. We have made changes to our system a couple of years ago where it's impossible to send a claim to a file if, uh, if the damage extent field was empty. One thing it doesn't do though is it doesn't address the content of the file. It just makes sure it isn't empty so, uh, of, that, of that field. So this is something we're very, very interested in and we want to do a better job. We have to do a better job, especially as we, 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 we rely on you folks to help us with estimates more and more and more. And uh, so, yeah, uh, please, if you've got some information on that, that is something we really need to see, so. Um, okay, what about that checklist? Is that something that uh, you think is a reasonable idea or? Like, like the checklist mm -hmm. for, for our adjusters, you're saying? Or, for, or, or for the, with the shops, before they send the file in for final print, just a kind of a quick little checklist for them to go through to make sure that you've got the documentation you need. We yes. were talking earlier that some cases there's a note put on uh, saying, could you please provide a better photo or something? And maybe, maybe that stuff needs to have a final just checklist off so that we can eliminate some of these administrative problems. Yes, and let's talk about it a little more if we don't mind, just so I can understand it. But for sure, sure. like anything to make it, we want to take more of the pressure off of you. We want to, we don't, you guys are busy. Our adjusters are busy. If we can eliminate the need for some of those calls, maybe we can help things like customer turnaround, our ability to get back to shops in a more effective time, those kinds of yep. things. The better information we give you, the less the less that you need to be, you know, dealing with those 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 additional extra calls. Okay. Nope. We'll leave that open. Final point that we have here is, uh, you know, and this goes back to when we started this whole discussion with Bill Zebart and and your team of people is when they first started this process and kind of putting more of the onus on the shops, the, the appraisal uh, supplements and that kind of stuff, the turnaround time was, you know, it was kind of originally pegged at roughly two hours. And I, I know in British Columbia, they did that for a while where, you know, they kind of give them a kind of a hard time limit of two hours and if that passed then the shop could carry on, subject to uh, uh, audit, of course. I mean, it's not, uh, it wasn't a blank check, but you know, they got back to people pretty quick. I, I checked with uh, ICBC guys uh, this this week, and uh, they're more like we are now, and they're back up now to a day or two, <laughs> and they're not happy about it because they did change that. But, you know, we're waiting right now, and you guys have talked. It's currently on average uh, some are quick, believe it or not. I don't know if you guys talk to you guys, but some are coming back quick, but we're still looking at roughly a day uh, or more to get a file back. Is there something we can do to work together to figure out a way to get that closer to that two hour window that we originally talked about five, six years ago? Sure, so, hey, um, so I'll speak to it, then I'll let Lyle have a quick uh, uh, go at it as well. Um, so uh, Lyle's done some great work. He's, uh, we've created and actually it's as a result of our, of our good leadership here through, through Ryan, we've actually been uh, access to additional resources so we've got three of them up to speed here actually just recently and uh, I'll let Lyle talk about kind of where he is there with those, uh, with our current turnaround time. Um, one of the couple of things that we're looking at and, and first thing is yes, we, we, we want to reduce the wait time as much as possible. A um, couple of things we've been doing and, and is um, where we have seen our times creeping above a day, we have been going in and auto accepting basically just, which is exactly what BC did. ICBC, when they, when they were getting above their four hour time, they were just auto accepting the files. We are doing it when we get to eight. Um, and we are we're we're pushing them through, um, and then dealing with them on the back end, like you said. Um, the other issue, though, that we're trying to do is some of these other things. Is this ask first accept KPI? One of the intents of that is this will assist us in reducing volumes and load on 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 the on the desk because what it will help us to do is to basically pull back on uh, and create opportunities for shops to bypass an interview and that will reduce it. We're also looking at um, some of the other things we're doing is doing like we talked about is that basically um, the pilot, we did it as part of COVID pilot where we basically um, are, are allowing supplements to flow through even though the information is not there and we just simply are saying, hey guys, we're gonna accept this, but could you please add those photos or add that invoice? as requested. So we are looking at those strategies. Um, right now, we're, we're quite excited. Um, we have more, we, have, we now, as of now, have more in, in, in uh, uh, supported image than we've ever had. 
um, and our times are down quite significantly. In fact, we're down to, uh, right now we're down, we're down to an hour <laughs> over the last two days. So now we're turning around. So the idea is, is because actually we just, we just had guys on three weeks of testing or training and they're coming off of it just now. So we're, we're seeing some pretty interesting stuff. So yeah, um, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe if you got some stuff you'd like to mention. I know that's great comments and yeah, and, and uh, appreciate the comments from Kieran and, and we we did, as Kira mentioned, we have uh, the most, probably the most amount of resources and, and capacity in the image group right now. We just uh, did get uh, some training done on, on three additional staff, so that's helping out. And our as Kira mentioned, our goal is is a, at a minimum of, of a day turnaround. So once we kind of get past that, then we do... Uh, uh, do some manual auto accept. So you'll notice that in the journal notes in the file that's been manually auto accepted. Uh, so we are doing that to kind of manage those, uh, that uh, service level. And, and we're happy, and we've been basically doing this since beginning of May. Uh, we implemented the process of, of making sure that we don't get anything above um, a, a business day turnaround. Um, recently, with our capacity, we're starting to see some of the success of it. And for example, I look at the queue right now and we're at um, 22 uh, claims in the queue with uh, the oldest one being sent at 926 this morning. So we're looking at 944, so we are, are within the hour. So um, we're continuing to try to work hard to manage it. And we understand that the quicker we get through the files, the quicker, uh, it, the better it is for us and for you, and, and we're committed to doing that. And, and as Kieran and Ryan mentioned, the ask for to accept um, is, is going to be a, a key, key KPI to kind of help those things flow along. And, and I think there's some good comments about um, what the role of the image desk is. And, and uh, as Ryan and Kieran mentioned, if it's, if, if we're, if it's deviating, deviating from the policy and gets, does it get sent to the image desk, those things, it's expected that there'll be a supplement on there and that, that's what really slows down the image desk. So we can kind of work through the other protocols to address those one-off occasions so that it doesn't fog up the image desk. Then we'll, I'm confident we'll be continuing to improve on the, the turnaround times. Thanks, Lyle. Thanks, guys. Uh, we pretty much uh, got that stuff wrapped up and I do want to, is there a question there? I'm sorry. No? Um, I do want to wrap up because uh, we have uh, Dave Lure coming on here at 10 o'clock and I have to go to the bathroom. Uh, anyway, <laughs> just kidding. But I uh, appreciate you guys and the time you've taken and I hope we didn't take too much from your Saturday presentation. I know you're going to give us an update on SCARP and uh, we might have touched on some of the areas here. But it's clear to me that you guys are working at making changes to make things work smoother. And, you know, from our executive, after we've had discussions back and forth with you guys over the last couple of weeks, we just want you to know that we're committed to trying to work together to figure out a way because we both want the same thing. You know, we want to get the car fixed and out the door as quick as possible properly. And uh, if we can figure out ways to work together rather than be banging heads, uh, that would be advantageous for all of us. So thank you for that. And I think you got the right team in place there. Thanks, Lyle. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. And Len, you're still there. You're not, they haven't let you go yet, you bugger. A poor guy. Give him a break. He's retired for crying out loud. Okay. We're happy to participate. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks for now. Talk to you later.